a new planet in our solar system for humans to call home, just in case the Earth gets all used up. If our survival as a species depended on it, just what would it take to turn the red planet blue? Mars is a red, barren, desolate world. Freezing plains and sheer cliffs, a permafrost layer embedded in the surface, massive volcanoes, and dry riverbeds that hint at the planet's watery past. Because Mars is so similar to Earth, the idea of terraforming Mars has come up in science fiction for decades. But to make Mars live and breathe again, this frozen wasteland will have to undergo a massive global warming. A key ingredient for terraforming Mars is to get all the solid carbon dioxide, the dry ice, out of Mars' soil and into the atmosphere. That would create higher pressures. It would also produce some greenhouse warming, raising temperatures. That would go a long way toward making it more sustainable for life. One of the polar caps of Mars is comprised mostly of frozen carbon dioxide. If we could somehow heat up that polar cap and release that carbon dioxide, put it back into the atmosphere, then you would start a process of thickening the atmosphere of Mars. That would be the first step toward terraforming it. One way would be to put up a bunch of satellites that would collect the sun's energy and focus them in on Mars. That would basically be absorbed by the surface. It would go into evaporating those ices, would free them up so that they form atmospheric gases. One could also put a bunch of dark material on the frozen polar ice caps of Mars. That dark material would absorb rather than reflect more of the sun's radiation, thus allowing that material and the ices underneath to heat up and evaporate those ices. When terraforming Mars for human habitation, there's one key ingredient you can't overlook. Earth has a fairly strong magnetic field. That magnetic field protects us from solar wind. Charged particles streaming out from the sun are shunted around Earth by Earth's magnetic field. Mars doesn't have that. Anybody who tried to live on the surface would have their body, their, their mass, constantly impinged upon by radiation from the sun. Taking a vacation trip to Mars is still science fiction. But mankind continues to draw closer to the day when ships from Earth will zip around our solar system. relatively easy to get around within our own solar system. 40 years ago, we traveled to the moon. We've sent spacecraft to all of the other planets in our solar system. The distances are measured in millions or billions of miles. That's local space travel. Interstellar travel is something much different. One of the very real problems that physics gives us is the limitation of the speed of light. When it comes to faster than light travel, traditionally, physicists have been speaking with one voice. No way, so say we all. But why is the speed of light a universal speed limit? That's what one of our viewers wanted to ask the universe. So they wrote to us on our website, why can't something travel faster than the speed of light? Well, a lot of people ask me that question. It's a favorite. You just can't get from here to there at a speed faster than that of light unless you're massless. One of the problems we have to figure out how to deal with is as we go faster, essentially our mass increases. And it takes more and more energy to increase our velocity. Only light, photons with no mass, can go at the speed of light. But anything that has mass would require an infinite amount of energy to get going that fast. It can't be done. It's impossible. 
In science fiction, this isn't a problem. Just invent some handy bit of futuristic tech to deal with it. What are dilithium crystals for? What aren't they for? Dilithium crystals make the warp engine go. That's all we need to say about it. There are various names that have been given to these kinds of technologies. Hyperdrive, uh, superluminal drive, stargates. More and more, scientists who've grown up watching their heroes whiz around the galaxy seem unwilling to flatly dismiss the possibility of faster-than-light travel. A scientist named Miguel Alcubier came up with a theoretical notion for a warp drive that would involve expanding space behind your starship and contracting it in front of your starship. And there was nothing in physics, in Einstein's theory or anybody else's, that says that space itself cannot stretch or be squeezed faster than the speed of light. In fact, we think that's exactly what happened when the universe was born. Space expanded much, much faster than the speed of light in the microseconds after the Big Bang, leading to the universe that we see around us today. So if you had enough energy, you could conceivably expand space behind you at 100 times the speed of light, squeeze space in front of you at 100 times the speed of light, and in effect, be traveling at 100 times the speed of light, even though in your own little bubble of space, you're never traveling faster than the speed of light. When a real-life astronaut wants to get somewhere in a hurry, the options are rather limited. Most spacecraft today use liquid fuel and solid fuel. The uh, space shuttle uses solid fuel boosters that are kind of like a big bottle rocket. Once you light them off, they're going. On the other hand, you also have chemical rockets. A very simple type would be liquid hydrogen and liquid oxygen. You just run them together, huge amount of energy, the byproduct's water, and a whole lot of heat. Now, the latest generation of deep space probes relies on entirely new technology, lifted straight from the pages of classic sci-fi stories. Ion drives. This is where you basically take atoms, strip off a few electrons, and you end up with a charged particle. Accelerate it with a magnetic field and send these high velocity particles out one end of the spacecraft. The difference between that and chemical engines is that with an ion engine, you have very, very low thrust. An ion engine generates the same amount of thrust as the weight of this piece of paper, but it does so for months at a time. And with constant, albeit small, acceleration for months, you can get up to some pretty high speeds. NASA's Dawn spacecraft is using ion power to close in on an encounter with Vesta and Ceres, two of the largest objects in our solar system's asteroid belt. <laughs> 